All right, you ready to do this? I'm ready. All right, Good. so here we, here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Very excited today to have as my guest, Kelly Smythe Dent. Kelly, welcome. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All right, so as a therapist, Kelly has seen that people desire to live a life that is filled with connection, balance, and purpose. It's her belief that oftentimes our upbringings, family dynamics, relationships, or trauma experiences can get in the way of having fulfilling relationships with ourselves and others. Most people struggle with fear, anxiety, depression, relationship issues, traumas, or more. Everybody struggles with something. Kelly believes, though, that it's not necessarily always a struggle that's unbearable, but sometimes a feeling of going through it alone. In her therapy practice, Kelly specializes in working with trauma and PTSD. She's been trained in social work, trauma-informed care, and EMDR. She spent many years working with immigrant and refugee populations from various countries and cultures. Um, she speaks Spanish and offers EMDR-based individual and group interventions all over the world through her business, Scaling Up. All right, way to go. Um, before we get going here, uh, share with our listeners, Kelly, where you're from originally and where you're currently calling from. I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, my family still lives there. And uh, so I have a strong connection to the East Coast, but now I live on the West Coast and I'm currently in Reno, Nevada. Oh, cool. All right. All right. Nice. I'm originally from the East Coast too. Oh, what part? Right. Well, born in Manhattan and then kind of a product of the tri-state area. Uh-huh. And where but are you now? I'm in Bend, Oregon. We just moved oh, here cool. from the Bay Area. We were there for a while, but uh, yeah, so transplant as well. Yeah, I also lived in North Carolina and Denver for a while, so I've kind of been, been right. around. Nice, nice, nice. All right, so let's get into it here. You know, I'm just really fascinated by how people get into this field mm -hmm. and work with people who've been impacted by trauma. So tell us your story. Yeah, so like you mentioned, I used to work with uh, refugee and immigrant populations, and I got into the nonprofit field working in refugee resettlement in North Carolina. So I was working with refugees who had come from, at the time, it was mostly uh, Vietnam, Iraq, uh, Bhutan, and Burma. Wow. And, uh, and what I was noticing is I, I did that for about five years, and I loved it. And, but what I was noticing is that a lot of them were coming with uh, PTSD or with uh, trauma, mental illness of some kind. And so they had spent all of this time, like physically trying to free themselves by getting resettled in another place. And they finally got here and were helping them get on their feet, but you could tell that they were, they were still in bondage um, emotionally. And the uh, services available were pretty scarce when you have, you know, unusual languages and dialects and different cultures and financial barriers and all this stuff. And so I felt really moved at that point to go into the mental health field with the, um, with the idea of wanting to work with that population, but also see what creative ways we could kind of expand oh, the so, services. So, excuse me. so but you were working with them, not as, as a therapist. Right. I was oh, doing okay. more case management oh, wow. um, okay. for an agency that would help basically refugee resettlement agencies help refugees who come over to the States, get on their feet, right. um, get them, you know, services, get them an apartment, get them a job, all that stuff, get them integrated into society here. Okay. So you see or notice that trauma is going on. Um, what do you do? What unfolds for you? What happens next? Yeah. So at that point I decided to go back to school and uh, go to uh, get my social work license and went into the mental health field. And so when I was in grad school, I was uh, working with a variety of different populations and I kind of just got to this place where I was like, everybody's coming in with trauma and I don't know what to do with that. You know, like I, I went to the University of Denver. It was a really great program, but a lot of what we learn in grad school, at least from my experience is a little less clinical work and more like theory and research and things like that, which are all useful. But when you're doing your practicums with clients and you're sitting face to face with them in the room, I personally didn't feel equipped enough mm -hmm. to know what to do other than kind of validate their trauma and stuff like that. And so that's when I got EMDR trained when I was in grad school. And uh, when I was getting EMDR trained, which I found immensely helpful, uh, it actually gave me an intervention to use with clients, you know, that were walking in my door. Um, and, and I really ascribe to their theories too around, um, you know, trauma and, and how that manifests. 
but I learned about group EMDR when I was getting trained. And when I learned how, when I was initially getting trained, I was like, how could you possibly do this in a group setting? Like it just blew my mind that that would even be available. And I realized that that would be the avenue that appealed to me to work with uh, populations from other countries and other cultures, because a lot of these cultures are very collective and communal. Mm -hmm. And so doing something together makes more sense than seeing a white individual therapist who doesn't speak your language and wants to talk about your experience. Like that's just not very, that's very Western way of doing therapy and healing. Right. And, um, and then in addition, like, so doing it in a group setting, uh, you don't have to talk about your trauma with EMDR, uh, which is really appealing to a lot of people. And you can have one interpreter for a large group of people, which is also useful. And you can also do it in intensive settings. So uh, one of the things that I do now is, well, pre-COVID is I would travel to refugee camps and I would partner with people and we would do two day group intensives. So oh. I could work with 60 adolescent refugees at one time uh, doing EMDR over the course of two days um, and get incredible results. And so it's just more accessible. It's more affordable. If you're going to charge people, mm -hmm. you know, um, they can pay less and it's still feasible for the therapist to conduct. So there's just a lot of benefits and it's just a different way of doing therapy. You know, it's kind of thinking outside the box than just the typical kind of one-on-one come to my office yeah. agency setting, which is just one way of doing therapy. I don't think I've, I've really, uh, talked about group EMDR. I don't even know if I've knew it was <laughs> thing but yeah. we really, let's come around to that come back to that but i'm really curious how what lured you or attracted you to work with this population in the first place and how was it being a white woman doing so yeah so um well i was already working with this population before i became a therapist so i was already kind of integrated and interested in doing that work so you're talking about when I was first getting into it. Initially. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was in my early 20s and I was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do for a career. I knew I wanted to be in the nonprofit sector of some kind, but that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And I knew I liked travel. I knew I liked working with other cultures. I was learning Spanish at the time and just like integrating myself with different types of communities. And, um, and the job just kind of came available. I applied, I happened to get it. And that's kind of how I got into the field and when I got into it, there was this joke that they're like, you never really leave refugee resettlement. Like once you're in, you may leave this position, but that just kind of captures you in a way that they're just like, you never really leave. And I get that now because I have Why? Left. Why is that? I don't know. I think um, it, if there's like a, maybe an intimacy that happens in that type of work, um, you know, working with refugees, um, at least from my experience, I mean, every refugee is different, but I've just found them to be such incredible people. Mm. Um, the most resilient people I've ever met. I mean, the kinds of things that refugees go through, um, typically they're living in refugee camps for decades with no, you know, known ability to leave. Like right now, the Rohingya population, hundreds of thousands of people, they have no ability to resettle elsewhere. So not every refugee gets to move somewhere like the US. In fact, maybe about 2% or less of the people each year that are living in refugee camps actually get resettled to a third country and get to start a new life there. So oftentimes they live in refugee camps for decades. Um, and pretty harsh conditions and um, have pretty severe mental illness as a result. There was a report that just came out about the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh where um, I think it's like 50 or 60% or more of the people are reported to have PTSD mm. um, in the population. And if you understand the kind of atrocities that they experience, it's not surprising. There's very, there are some mental health therapies in the camps, but it's not the highest priority because the highest priority is getting them food and nutrition and shelter mm -hmm. and really just trying to get their basic needs met. And the mental health tends to be kind of the second tier um, that doesn't, that gets neglected a lot, I think. You mentioned the Rohingya, Rohingya where are they mm -hmm. located? Yeah, so they're from Myanmar. Okay. Um, and they're a Muslim population that's been um, oppressed and crossed the border. Most of them, some of them are in Thailand and other countries, but most of them are in Bangladesh across the border. So part of what makes you a, a refugee versus a displaced person. So there's lots of displaced people um, that are need to leave their homes because it's not safe, but they stay within their country of origin. So there's millions of displaced people around the world um, that are just basically moving around their country trying to find safety. 
um, refugees actually flee to another country, um, usually a bordering country. And then usually UNHCR, the, the UN um, High Commissioner for Refugees will help them get um, set up with uh, housing and kind of create a community and get services and things like that. And then they'll also try to negotiate to fix the issues in the home country so that ideally we want refugees to be able to go back safely to their mm -hmm. home country. But if that's not possible, then they try to integrate them into the country in which the refugee camps are. But that is also politically challenging and, and uh, resource heavy for the country in which they're living. And that's not always an option. And then if that's not an option, they open it up to third party um, or, or third country uh, uh, resettlement, which would be a place like Canada, the US, Australia, other countries like that. But it's a very low, you know, number of, mm -hmm. I think the US takes in, at this point, the numbers are pretty low. I think it's maybe 30,000 a year or something. And I mean, there's millions of refugees worldwide. And the US you typically historically has taken on the most number of refugees out of all of the different countries. And right now our numbers are super low. So it's a really tragic situation, very hopeless. A lot of people are like, is this going to be our whole life in this refugee oh, camp? They, they don't know. And so the trauma is really extensive and the resources are very scarce. Talk about, if you will, some of the challenges that come with being a white woman working with refugees. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, people listening could think of some obvious things, but share with us your experience. Yeah. So from my experience, um, my approach is to take a decolonized approach to mental health and therapy. So for example, I will only go into a situation to provide services if I'm invited by the local people. Um, if there's a leader in the group that wants these kinds of services, the tricky part is that nobody in their community is trained in EMDR. A lot of them are not even mental health specialists, right? So they're wanting tools, they're wanting interventions, they're wanting services, and ultimately they're wanting training, which is something that we're working on. The, the, the uh, prospect of, of training frontline workers um, in EMDR who live in the camps, for example, to be able to do it effectively and safely because we don't have EMDR therapists in the Rohingya refugee camp. So even if they wanted EMDR treatment for their PTSD, they don't have anybody to provide it for them. The Rohingya are not, uh, there's no higher education in refugee camps. Mm -hmm. um, there's no formal education in refugee camps. So if you want treatment like that, you need somebody to come in. And so, um, so I do a lot of my own internal anti-oppression work um, and I seek out uh, assistance um, and uh, teaching and consultation and things like that to learn a lot of my own biases and prejudices and ways in which um, I accidentally colonize other people and ways well, in which give us my an example. white- Give us an example. Um, an example think. could be like coming into a community and being like, this is the way that you have to find healing. This is the way that mm -hmm. you do things, right? That's a colonial way of being is saying, you know, I know that you know your community and you live here, but I'm gonna come as the expert and tell you how to do things differently. And that's a very different what approach that I don't want to take versus coming in and saying, what do you need? How can I help? This is what I can offer. You know, what can I do basically? And really building relationships with them. And maybe the answer is we don't need your help, in which case you leave, right? Um, but sometimes they do want help and they do want your services or they want your tools or they want train. A lot of them want training. Um, they, they don't want to rely on other people to provide things for them. They want to provide things for themselves. And so a lot of it is figuring out what you can do to help facilitate that, to give them what they need so that they can take care of their own people. Um, I share with us kind of an early clinical error. I'm imagining there, you know, there's got to be some going into this, working with this population. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really intimidating to be, um, I guess, kind of a groundbreaker, you know, when you're coming in and you're doing something that hasn't been done before, um, which is the case, at least maybe that you haven't done before. But with this group in their, uh, EMDR intervention, it's by Dr. Herrero, it's called the EMDR Integrative Group Treatment Protocol. So right now, I think we have about 20 or 30 published articles on using the group EMDR intervention. A lot of them are actually conducted with refugees. Um, so we have a lot of evidence of its, uh, its ability to work with a variety of populations. Um, however, when I've gone into different communities, there's always 
surprises. The environment is different than you expect. The way in which people respond, what's okay and not okay for them um, is always kind of an experiment. Um, and going into it with a beginner's mind and some humility of, okay, I'm coming in with this knowledge, right? I'm an expert in this, but I'm not an expert in this person or this culture or this setting. So how do I offer what I have to offer in a way that's going to fit best with this group? Um, and so there's always blunders and surprises that come about um, in that process. And I think one of the areas that is, um, I think, the most talked about um, and nerve wracking for EMDR therapists, especially with the idea of training frontline workers um, is like dissociation tends to be kind of a scary word for a lot of people of like, what if they dissociate or what if they decompensate, which I don't exactly know what that means, but it's a term that gets thrown around a lot. Like there's a lot of fear, mm -hmm. you know, what if you activate all this stuff and you don't get the proper support and then they suicide, you know, are you going to be responsible for that? And there's a lot of debate around that. And so, you know, for me early on, I mean, there's always, so there's always mistakes I'm making clinical and otherwise, you know, trying to learn about different cultures and working in different environments. But for me, dissociation was probably one of the bigger ones that I was learning, especially early on as an EMDR clinician of what that even means. Like, I didn't know what that meant when I was in grad school. Um, it's important for you to know what it is if you're an EMDR therapist. Um, and what to do with it. And so when I was first learning about dissociation, I was finding that um, because I didn't fully understand what it meant, I would kind of, I think, push clients a little bit faster than they were able or willing to process mm -hmm. and, and push them kind of accidentally, uh, what we say outside of our, their window of tolerance where they get a little bit flooded or they get a little bit overwhelmed because I didn't quite understand. And so it took me a while through, I think a lot of consultation um, and like filming my sessions and things like that to try to help my consultant kind of figure out what it was looking like and how I was responding and what I, what was happening, how I could do that differently. Um, so I would say kind of thinking back on like clinical mistakes, that was like a learn, a bigger learning curve for me when I was, and again, I learned EMDR in grad school. So I was a very, very new clinician when I got trained. So there was a lot of new stuff. And blunders. Are you talking about the association while doing a one-on-one -on -one EMDR or group or both? Uh, technically both, but we actually have not seen reports of it done, uh, of dissociation experience in a group setting yet. Okay. Um, and there are theories behind that. Um, so in a one-on-one -on -one EMDR session, you're doing, you know, eye movement and the therapist is guiding the bilateral stimulation process. And so sometimes what happens is because you're not in that person's body and brain, you don't necessarily always know, even though you're trying to be attuned to the client and, and pay attention to their affect and what they're saying and things like that. Sometimes they get outside of their window of tolerance and they may dissociate during EMDR, in which case the therapist is then trying to titrate the process in a way that's manageable and tolerable for that person. And then they're kind of bringing them back into the present moment and grounding them which in an individual setting is very manageable. In a group setting, what we're finding is that our theory is that people are not dissociating because the client is in complete control of the process. So in a group setting, we use what's called the butterfly hug where the clients are tapping on themselves and they are not being told how long or what pace at which to do the tapping. And so our theory, what we'll find is that when you're watching people do it in a group setting, some people are going really fast. Mm. Some people are going really slow. Some people will stop for a little bit and then they'll start again. And it's all happening intuitively. They're just listening to their own bodies and doing it without realizing. And so our theory is that they are naturally and organically keeping themselves inside of their window of tolerance while doing that, which is why we're not seeing the dissociation. Mm. Interesting. So that was kind of a little bit about how, uh, group MDR is, is utilized, but give us a little more. I, how many people, how is it, how does it work? Yeah. So we basically, I mean, we have a script, um, that we use. And so, uh, there's a leader who's an EMDR therapist. So you need to have at least one EMDR therapist there. The others don't need to be EMDR therapists, but they would need to be properly trained on how to support the EMDR therapists. 
Um, so at least the leader is an EMDR therapist. They're basically following a script. They're reading a script in a setting that feels like a therapy room, not like a teacher setting. Mm -hmm. So there's some kind of training and intentionality that needs to go into how you're doing and in what environment you're creating in the group setting. Because people could follow your instructions and not actually sink into the EMDR experience. Um, if it feels like a, like a teacher giving a lecture and giving instructions on what to do. Mm -hmm. So you're following those instructions. And then we have what's called an emotional protection team. And so with an emotional protection team, those are other, they could be EMDR therapists. They could be therapists. They could be teachers from the community. They could be case managers. Like when I go to refugee camps, they're typically case managers that are trained in some mental health interventions and are support people in the community. Um, because I don't have other EMDR therapists there to, to assist me. And so I will do a little bit of training um, with them beforehand so that they know how to do, provide proper support. And they're really kind of containing the space. Um, they're helping make sure people are following the instructions properly. Um, they're answering questions. And they're also just creating, they're with, with their nonverbals, they're creating an environment of containment mm -hmm. um, that makes people feel safe to do their own individual EMDR processing in a group setting. How many and people so in this group, Kelly, generally? You can have as many as you want. So you need one emotional protection team member for every 10 adults in the group or every five kids in the group. So for example, when I was in Ethiopia, we had 60 adolescent kids there and I had an emotional protection team of, I think we had more than we needed. I think we had about 20 people um, there and that all knew the kids and worked with them. And so um, I know some people have done a few hundred people at one time. So if you have the space and the logistics are taken care of and the ability to do that, you can do very large groups. You can also do small groups, like a family. If a family is in a car accident together, um, you can do like a family group EMDR or couples, you know, two people would be a group. Um, the only thing that you need is that everybody in the group has a collective trauma experience. So okay. for example, if you're working with refugees, everybody, the target that you're focusing on is the refugee journey, right? Because that's the one experience they all have in common. Um, if you're working with sexual assault survivors, everybody's focusing on their sexual assault experience. So you know what everybody's focusing on beforehand. There's a couple of screening questions and things like that um, to make sure that you're eligible, but you basically follow the script. And Dr. Herrero has a training online on our website at scalingupemdr.com for EMDR therapists. Wow. So it's not, so it's the same um, kind of trauma experience, not the same exact experience. Correct. Okay. Right. You don't have to experience the exact same trauma together at the same time, Got although it. you could. Most of the time, these people don't know each other or they've had different experiences, but it's the same theme that you're focusing on. Okay. Okay. So let me just remind everyone, I'm spe speaking with Kelly Smythe Dent. And where uh, can people get in contact with you, Kelly? Uh, so my website is scalingupemdr.com. Um, we also have a summit coming up that's free to attend live that you can find oh. at beboldsummit.com. And you what can is contact that? us from either website. So the Be Bold Summit is, this is our first annual summit. I'm really excited about it. So throughout my networking and, and the work that I do internationally, I found that a lot of therapists want to do uh, humanitarian work. That could be international, it could be online, it could also be in their own backyard. Um, we have mass shootings all the time in the US, we have natural disasters, we have things, got, we have COVID happening, right? There's a lot of things happening in the world in our own backyard that therapists want to be able to do rapid response teams within their own community and elsewhere. And so we do that at Scaling Up. And so the summit is designed to bring humanitarian workers together, mental health therapists together who want to create systemic change, who wanna do rapid response teams, who wanna think outside the box and do um, work maybe outside of just the therapy room, you know, maybe in addition to their private practice or in response to some sort of collective trauma. And so we have 25 speakers that are talking about all sorts of different issues. It could be creating uh, anti-oppression um, systemic changes within the mental health field and in bold and new ways. Um, it could be traveling to Bangladesh and working with refugees and um, doing all sorts of different types of interventions and really helping people network together too, who mm -hmm. want to do that work together so that they can find each other. Um, so I have partners all over the world that I've worked with that have are aligned in our vision and our mission and 
you know, we work together and collaborate. And I think finding those people is pretty uh, crucial. And so we're hoping that this summit will be a good connector for people. That too. sounds amazing. When is the summit? It starts on May 17th and it lasts until the 28th. So it's actually 10 days long. We have two or three speakers a day. And we did that to try to make it more accessible because most people can't take like a full day off work. Um, and so you can join us live. We have the schedule online. Um, so you can pick your favorite speakers, join us live for free. Some of the speakers are gonna be in the chat too. So you can mm -hmm. actually chat with them. Um, and then each of the recordings will be available for 24 hours after the live event. So if you're trying to access it for free, you can do it that way if you can't join us live. And then we'll also have extended access for purchase if people want access for a year or some of the other benefits that we offer. Mm, very cool. Yeah. So kind of as, as we wind down here, um, what is it, Kelly, uh, you know, you talked about the intimacy of this working with this population and, you know, kind of once you work with this population, you're, you're hooked. What is it about you? Do you feel, do you maybe know that allows you to do this work? What is it about me specifically yeah. that allows yeah. me to do this work? That hmm. helps you do this work that maybe you would even say, this is why I do this work. You know, this is what allows me to do this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I grew up in a family that was very compassionate and like interested in helping people. So I think a part of, of it, you know, that desire might just have been ingrained in me as a young kid and always been interested in um, international work and travel and different cultures and languages so that maybe that's part of, you know, the interest for me. Um, it also just, you know, the people that I find in this field, they just really care a lot about the people that they work with. And so you get very connected to the clients who, um, who just are so appreciative of the work that you're doing and the things that you want to do to help them. And they're very open and just incredibly resilient, generous people um, who deserve a better life than what they're given um, and who are really stuck. Um, in their situation. And um, it, it's a massive human rights issue in our, in our mm -hmm. world. And, um, and so I think between that, and then also the, the, the humanitarian workers that are working with that population, I also really connect with them too. So the people that I collaborate with, um, really align with my values and my interests. And so I think there's just kind of, um, I don't know, that's the best way I can describe it, kind of an intimacy when you, when you find the people that align with your mission in life and your value system, it's really powerful. And you're going to make more change together than you are alone. You're also going to be able to sustain this work better because when you're constantly exposed to violence, human rights issues, traumas vicariously, and just, I mean, as an, as an individual, everybody will experience it too. And, you know, some type of violence or trauma um, just by being alive. But when you're constantly vicariously affected by it, you really need to connect with those support systems that really understand that work and are also connected to the same issues to help make it sustainable. And I think we all know that it has a high burnout rate, you know, being a humanitarian worker or on the front lines, um, you just have a high burnout rate. And so you kind of need to rely on each other to find that sustainability and to not need to leave the field because you've pushed yourself too far too fast. I mean, it's such a big systemic issue that, and that's something I realized early on in the field too, is I love doing the one-on-one -on -one work with clients and I'll always do that. Um, right now I'm doing part-time private practice, um, but a lot of what walks in our door is trauma of systemic issues. And so if we're also as, as therapists, not working on policy, on politics, on human rights, activism, things like that, anti-oppression work, then we are putting band-aids on issues that, you know, could be preventative, prevented if we work on the systemic nature of it too. And I think working on systemic issues as a mental health therapist is doing mental health in another way by trying to help prevent traumas in people's lives that could be preventable. Maybe a car accident isn't preventable, but the refugee issue, like that's a human rights issue that shouldn't exist in our, in our society. It's very complicated, but you know, let's do some human rights activism and see if we can help prevent the trauma from even happening in the first place. Awesome, man. Very inspiring. Um, how about a go-to book recommendation? Then we'll, we'll close out here. 
Yeah, I spent a little time thinking about this. And the thing that came to mind um, is The Mummy at the Dining Room Table. Have you heard of that book? I uh, by I have. Jeffrey Cutler and John Carlson. Um, it's about how therapists reveal their most unusual cases and what they teach us about human behavior. So I find it really entertaining because um, they're really fascinating cases that just like blow your mind. Like what somebody did this? Like the, <laughs> the, the case that they talk about in the title is a case of somebody who died and they like mummified this person and they literally sit at the dining room table and they treat that person like they're oh still alive, right? That's, that's a human behavior. It may not be common, but it just talks about some of these more outlandish, unusual behaviors that might shock a therapist, but then it digs deeper into the understanding behind the behavior because, you know, from a therapeutic perspective, every behavior makes sense if you understand somebody's story, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're digging into the story and the why and where this is coming from. And so it does that in a more kind of outlandish, kind of somewhat entertaining way that, um, that I really enjoyed. Awesome. So we'll have that uh, linked up here at the show notes page at the trauma podcast.com, as well as your, the link for your summit. That's okay. Oh, great. Yeah. I would love that. I'd love okay. for any, anybody interested to join us. Okay. Well, awesome. Kelly, a delight and super inspiring man. Um, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking about this stuff. All right. Take care. Be well. Have a good one. Bye.